Hi, everybody. Welcome to Business Computing Weekly. This is episode number 379. We're recorded on Sunday, December the 2nd, 2012. We want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Of course, th this show can be seen uh, on YouTube. We also do a convert this to an audio podcast that's available on iTunes, uh, Podomatic, and, and of course, I got some background noise right there. We go. Uh, so we can see it on Podomatic, or we can hear it on Podomatic and iTunes and, and all that. So there's a lot of different ways to catch the program. We all, we have with us, as always, Mr. Jack McLean and McLean's Computers. Uh, joining us tonight, uh, we are sponsored by FrugalBrothers.com and GFI Software. And just want to take a quick uh, moment to announce the introduction of GFI FaxMaker 2013. This is this is you know GFI just did a poll and found that two out of three companies out there still rely quite heavily on faxes. I know it's hard to believe, folks. I know it's hard to believe that people still, but they do. Manufacturing, hospitals, retail. All these folks are still big power users of faxes, and FaxMaker is an affordable network fax solution. And with 2013, you can now, it works with uh, what we call SIP providers. So even if you don't have fax lines, and you don't have you know fax modems, and you don't have uh, expensive fax boards, you don't need it. With FaxMaker 2013, uh, they made it really easy. And it also works with Gmail now, it works with Exchange, um, it works with Office 365. For more information, contact frugalbrothers.com. The link will be in the video to the website, and uh, and that's that. In tonight's show, uh, you know we we are our, our our little neck of the woods here is we like to talk about maximizing your IT dollar and being frugal. Means getting the most value for your money. Doesn't mean being cheap, but it just means getting the most value for your money. And in that note, we want to talk a little bit tonight about planning out your infrastructure for growth for your small business. As, as and this can actually apply to your home network as well. This is this isn't just business, but sometimes there's an overlap there. And uh, I, Jack, um, to me, the the first thing decision you have to make. Of course, just like our last program was, if the, if your business requires a specific type of application to function, that will dictate what we said the hardware would be, uh, whether you're going to go or operating system in the hardware and so forth. Right? We 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 mentioned that in another show. But that aside, and I don't know about your experience, but my experience has been that. A lot of businesses, especially very small businesses, tend to do everything ad hoc. They just kind of buy stuff, you know, kind of willy-nilly, and then try to kludge it all together. And they, you know, when okay, they get another employee, they go out and buy another computer, and, and, and they hook it up until eventually uh, somebody has to come straighten this mess out because there, they, there's no thought given to things like. Uh, backup and disaster recovery. There's no thought about bandwidth on the network. There's no thought necessarily about things like security. Um, you know, is is uh, storage? All, all these all these things. Um, so, Jack, what? Let's start with you. What advice would you give somebody that's planning? Okay, I'm going to go into business. I'm going to start setting up, or I'm going to take what I got and get it all straightened out. What would be your advice, the first thing they should do? Well, I think uh, I think you started saying it best. Uh, it's going to depend a lot on what you plan on doing and what applications you actually plan on running. Um, you know, the platform you decide to go with, you have to look at, there, there's a variety of different things. You have to look at security. You have to look at the way, um, the way, what you're looking at is going to integrate with what you do, um, and and I'm honestly I'm guilty of doing exactly what you just talked about, taking a bunch of stuff and kind of jumbling jumbling it together and trying to get a working system out of it. Um, I'm guilty of that, and if I had it to do over again, I would go about it quite a bit differently. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 very guilty of doing just what you said that you shouldn't do is try to jumble together a bunch of different things and make it work in my environment. Um, there's, there's different reasons for that. 
I mean, one, I'm a tech, so I have to, I have to play around with these different devices. I have to, you know, play around with these different operating systems, etc. But, but for a business, when you're looking at a, a small business, it just needs to work, and they don't have time to sit there and fiddle with uh, different things to try to make everything work correctly. So in that sense, um, I, I think you sitting down and actually planning out what you plan to run, what applications, what software uh, uh, is necessary to what you're going to do. That, that, that's the first step. You have to sit down and you have to plan these things out. And then from there you can go on to, you know, what, what hardware is best going to suit my needs uh, as far as, you know, the, the applications that I'm going to need to run on. Well, I... You, you know, I, I, if I, you have a, and I know that, you know, especially small little businesses, uh, uh, what we call micro businesses, a micro business can be a company of like one or two people, mm -hmm. you know, up to about five people is kind of a micro business. And, and those type of organizations really, they got to get a dollar out of a dime. You got to get a dollar for the work out of a dime. Right. right. They don't really have the money to hire uh, consultants and they don't have the budget to buy normally high-end equipment mm -hmm. and so forth. But what they, they uh, but maybe that is something that they should do from the get-go is sit down with a, a technician at least uh, and just kind of map out in phases what can we do now with what we got and then what's the best way to go I think you're right I think that's uh, that's probably the most important first step you could take and that doesn't mean that you have to uh, uh, I think where a lot of people go wrong they believe that if they're gonna hire a tech for advice they're gonna have to pay you know they're gonna call this uh, this tech up and they're gonna have him come over and have to pay him by the hour to sit down and help them map uh, map out a strategy for their uh, their small office or their small business, uh, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you can sit down with a tech for probably a couple of hours, and during that time, you can get an idea of what direction you need to go in. That doesn't mean necessarily you have to have his uh, you have to have this this tech to hold your hand through the whole way. But you know, of course, if you can afford that, great. You know, that that probably be the way to do it right there. If you have a knowledgeable tech that you can have to hold your hand through this, that, that would probably be your best bet. But if you're trying to save money, I mean, just sit down for a couple of hours and get some advice and kind of get an idea of what direction you want to go. That would probably be the, the best first step you could take. I, I think that makes sense. You know, um, you know I, I've started several companies in my lifetime, and I always have this real basic game plan where, I would never open up a business unless I had an accountant, uh, you know, a CPA, uh, an attorney, uh, good, bad, or different. <laughs> you got to have attorneys. But I think that you have to treat your technician in that same category as part of your toolbox of, of things uh, before you really open your doors. Because we, we all uh, because really technology enables you to do so much more for so much less than ever. Right. Okay. Let's talk about platforms for for just a minute. Now, there's three major platforms out there. Of course, we have the Windows platform from Microsoft. We have the uh, Apple platform, and we have the Linux platform. Now I won't, and I think Google kind of skirts between that Apple and Linux type platform. I mean, actually, it is a form of of, of Linux. Yeah, I see it leaning more towards the, the Linux side of things. Yeah, more more towards the uh, yeah more towards the Linux side of things. But I, I'm not going to actually go so far as to call it a platform, but it's certainly a common denominator because it seems to work well uh, with whether you're using Windows, Mac, or, or Linux for the most part. Well, I think they, they try to fashion themselves more as a, uh, a hybrid than an actual platform. It's more, yeah, I, so I won't consider that a platform. Let's, let's talk about the, the three platforms. I'll take the Microsoft platform. You, sir, with the Apple logo hat, will take the... <laughs> hey, let, me, let me get rid of that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You gotta put me on the spot now. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, I'll let you take the Apple platform, and then we'll both kind of maybe 
share in the Linux platform. But I'll start with the, the Microsoft platform. First off, uh, I think people gravitate to what they know, number one. And if people use Windows, um, unless you're starting a tech firm, but you know, if you're starting a restaurant chain or you're starting a dry cleaning business, whatever, um, I think a lot of people, generally because their familiarity with Windows, gravitate to Windows right off the bat and never think or give much thought to the Apple platform or to Linux. Is Microsoft. I, I, I got to have Microsoft. Right. Uh, and I need uh, Microsoft Office. Got got to have that. Uh, and that can be uh, when you look at the licensing costs of the software. That okay. that platform can be expensive because here's the thing: once you get into a platform, you begin to get locked into that platform. And changing, making up your mind, go, this ain't working out for us. We want to change. Can be really expensive, and it's it expensive really fast. Yeah, it it, it, it does uh, making that transition because even though there uh, take Microsoft Office for Windows, and that Apple's got a version of uh, Microsoft uh, Office, the two aren't exactly alike. They don't look necessarily alike. They don't necessarily operate exactly the same. There's differences there between the two. Right. Mm. So choosing the right platform. On the Windows side of things, uh, you've got a lot of choices in hardware manufacturers, a lot of different companies selling a lot of different Windows machines. Uh, and, and now, of course, we have Windows 8, uh, which is out, which now, uh, and we, we're not going to go into a lot of the, we've already covered uh, uh, that, but it, it brings a new metaphor. Uh, or attempting to bring something new to the desktop, which is a touch interface. And it is designed for touch first. And there are touch-enabled laptops out there coming out today and touch-based uh, tablets all running Windows. But it also can function more in the role of a traditional desktop. But, let's, but then we're just talking about that PC, but we're not talking about infrastructure. Uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, and I've seen this, and I've seen small businesses end up by uh, hiring consultants who end up uh, with a small business server and they're running Exchange and everybody's using Outlook and, and all this, and they're looking at a, a, a very expensive proposition. Well, here's the point. If you go the Microsoft route, and this is the platform you want, the key advantage, of course, is going to be lots of choice, all different price points, but you will be very much locked into that Microsoft ecosystem uh, unless you do a hybrid type of thing. In other words, if you say, okay, uh, maybe we will uh, utilize Google Apps or we'll utilize Gmail and then we'll use uh, maybe just Word or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios there uh, that you can come up with. But once you get into that Microsoft platform, the general theory, I think, is that you will progress from maybe starting off with a peer-to-peer uh, -peer network and then getting yourself a server and then getting exchange. And then as you grow you'll start buying these enterprise tools or you will lease or rent these enterprise tools in a cloud provided by Microsoft. They're in the, they're in the platform business. Um, but Microsoft really doesn't make hardware per se. They don't make PCs yet or if ever. They don't do that. They do make tablets. They do not make a phone as of yet. Just tablets only for right now. That may change. Microsoft now says they're going to be a devices and software company. So that may change somewhere down the road. But for right now, that's where it's at. But the PCs come in varying qual various you know, quality and price points. Um, but that's the most common way I think a lot of businesses start out with a, with a bunch of Windows computers. Um, jump in anytime there, Jack. <laughs> uh, no, I think you're right. I mean, um, 
most people, most people have experience with Windows. And you're right when you, um, or you're correct when you say that, you know, familiarity with the, with the operating system uh, just kind of carries over to the, uh, the office environment a lot of times. Um, if, especially if you're going to have employees that are going to be, uh, they're going to be doing some work at the office and they're going to be taking some of this work home with them. Uh, you know, the familiarity of the operating system, I think, could be a big component. But I think it kind of comes back to what do you need to run for your environment? Uh, do you need Microsoft Office? Is that something you have to have? Is that Are you married to Exchange? Uh, do you have to have it? Do you have to have QuickBooks? And we, I think we discussed QuickBooks uh, last week uh, after we went off air. And, um, I, you know, I think that's, that, that's a major consideration. If you, need, if you need a particular type of software, now, now you know what the direction I'm going to go with this on the Mac side, but um, the Macs aren't. You know, even though I'm a Mac fan, and I'll be the first person to tell you how big of a Mac fan I am, it's not for everybody, and it's not for every situation. It's not a, uh, a, a, a one size fits all sort of thing. And I'll be the first person to say it. It's just not for everybody. Now there are some benefits uh, going to the Mac side of things. One. Um, you said, you know, you started talking about the various quality of hardware that, that can be found on the Windows side. You can go from your $300 Walmart PC to your, you know, your uh, four or $5,000 workstation and, and, you know, and all grades in between. And you have varying quality levels. Well, that's, that's a good thing in some, you know, some respects because, you know, you can, if you, if you need to get by on the cheap, you can do that. If you need high quality, you can do that. Whereas with the, with the, and, but the problem with that is not everybody knows, not everybody understands there's a difference in quality. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, when people see specs, they see 500 gig hard drive versus 500 gig hard drive. They don't understand that one hard drive may be a Western Digital or a uh, Seagate, and the other hard drive may be, you know, some off-brand hard drive that no one's ever even heard of that's going to die in six months. Uh, so they don't see a difference in quality there. They just see spec for spec, and I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. So I think there's more opportunity to screw up on the Windows side of things as far as picking hardware, whereas when you go with Apple hardware, uh, I think you're more likely to get a very positive uh, experience with their hardware than you are on the PC side of things. Unless you have a tech custom build your systems uh, to, to exact standards or to a higher standard than, uh, you know, than would be, than, you know, just going out and picking out the system yourself. So unless you're going to do that and you're going to hire a tech to go out and build custom build these systems to a higher standard, I think you're more likely to get higher quality hardware that's going to last longer and have a greater resale value on the Mac side of things. And that's another thing. Uh, how long is your hardware going to hold up and are you going to be able to get a return on that, uh, say, three, four, five years down the line? Well, if you buy a PC, uh, a Windows-based PC, whether custom built or you go to your, your big box store, Best Buy, Office Max, whatever, and you buy a PC, uh, in three years, are you going to be able to get anything for that PC if you should decide to upgrade? No. You're going to have to pay somebody to take that machine off your hands. There's no way you're going to be able to sell it and get really any money out of it. On the Mac side of things, they hold their value really well. So you can theoretically keep your Mac for three, four years and sell it for three-fourths of what you have in it. I've done it. So, you know, on that side of things, you can recoup a lot of your costs, and it makes the upgrade path, in my opinion, a little bit easier uh, because in three to five years, you decide to upgrade the PC side of things. You have to buy all new equipment. Uh, you're looking at a much bigger chunk of uh, profit having to come off that than you would be on the Mac side of things. You're going to be able to sell a lot of your Mac equipment and recoup a large part of your cost. So that's another aspect as far as the uh, hardware goes. Now, on the software side of things, if you're looking for integration with uh, mobile devices, I don't think there's any comparison on the PC side of things to what the uh, Apple ecosystem is. I don't think you can compare uh, anything Windows or um, Android to what the uh, what the Apple ecosystem can offer as far as the integration with iOS devices, 
and the uh, the OS 10 platform. I don't think I don't think uh, Android or Windows or you know any other platform even comes close to that ty that type of integration. So, well, let's yeah let's let's talk about that just a little bit on the Windows side of things. Uh, uh, platform on on the Windows platform, uh, there is Windows Phone, uh, and there is uh, the newest version has just really come out. Uh, 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 Windows Phone 8, right. uh, I believe that's what it is. It's not real popular right now, uh, and that's being as honest with you as I can. Uh, even though Microsoft says they're selling four times as many Windows phones today than they were a year ago at this time. Uh, it's still not, it's still not very many. Instead of selling, you know, it's it's all relative. It, it's all relative, right. but I, I think the point is there there is a platform, a Windows platform out there, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. for the phone, uh, that works nice with Exchange and it works nice with uh, Office three sixty five. Mm -hmm. Maybe not quite as much. Um, uh, maybe not quite as much as. Um, uh, say an Android or a, a natively as an Android device with Google stuff, but it still works. Right. Um, we actually just got a, a viewer a viewer question in here, and I want to uh, might as well just go ahead and address that uh, real yeah. quickly. Um, the question comes: Which uh, Android devices uh, do do you own? Any Android devices, uh, Jack? I did own. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, for years I was an Android guy exclusively, as far as my phones are concerned. That's the okay. only phones I owned until uh, this past year when I went to an iPhone 4s. And what what Android device did you have? What was uh, your last one? I believe it was a Droid 3. Okay, Droid 3. So how does that compare? Um, how would you say the iOS compares with the Android? Uh, and what Opry, I should say, what op, what version of Android was that running? Uh, honestly, I don't remember what version it was running. I do remember at the time that I was I was limited um, as far as how far I could upgrade it. I could not upgrade it to the uh, the latest Android operating system, and I was frustrated by that. And that was one of the things that that really frustrated me about Android is that there would be a new phone come out. It seemed it well. This is probably an exaggeration, but it seemed like there would be a new phone come out almost weekly, and some of the newest phones that come out, you cannot upgrade to the latest version of Android. And it just really frustrated me that uh, the, the Android operating, or the Android ecosystem was that fragmented that I could buy a brand new phone and could not upgrade it to the latest operating system. Or, you know, maybe a phone that's been out for a couple of months, and I could not upgrade it to the latest OS. So... As far as how Android compares to uh, uh, to iOS, in my opinion, it doesn't compare compare very well to iOS. I understand there are some features available in Android that um, that iOS does not have, but I think a lot of it is, uh, for the most part, I think a lot of it is gimmicks and novelties uh, versus you know stuff that I'm actually going to use. And I catch myself using my iPhone a lot more than I did my Android device, even though I had a lot of the same applications on the, uh, the Android device as I have on my iPhone currently, I find myself using the iOS device a lot more, just because to me it feels more intuitive and it's easier to use and it's easier to navigate and I don't have to think about uh, uh, what I'm doing as much as I did on the Android side of things just to make things work. Now I do understand that they have come a long way uh, in the past year with, uh, you know, especially with like Jelly Bean. I understand, you know, it, it has certain features and they've come a long way with it. But, you know, it's not like iOS is just sitting back not making any progress with uh, iOS 6. Well, you know, I, uh, if people ask me about, you know, do I use Android? What do I know about Android? Right. Uh, and I'm going to say this first off. Um, I've never been a big Android fan. Right. Uh, okay. No, not really. I, I never really cared for the way it works. I never cared for the way it it, uh, uh, it, it you do things with it. Just never been a big fan. I've never owned an Android device, not one. Okay, but that's because I've looked at Android 
I looked at the iPhone at the time, and I think this goes back. My first iPhone was the 3GS. Mm -hmm. Okay, and to me at the time, the the uh, the the 3GS and iOS looked far superior to the Android market. Offered way more apps than mm -hmm. the Android market. Uh, it worked very nicely with my, uh, my other Apple gear. Uh, it made no sense from a dollar perspective. Why would I invest in an Android phone when I'm running Macs? It didn't make a lot of sense to me. See, that was a big turning point for me as well because uh, I bought a uh, I bought a uh, MacBook. My my first Apple computer was a MacBook I purchased back in 2008. And my idea was when I got ready to, to switch phones, um, I, I just kind of looked at the, the operating system, the Mac operating system and the, the Mac laptop, and I, I said to myself, if they can do a computer this well, what can they do with a phone? And I, I actually got a chance to play with a friend of mine, their iPhone, and after about 30 minutes on their iPhone, I did not want to look at my droid anymore. I, I looked at my droid and I thought, piece of garbage. Well, you're right. I think everybody makes the case when they're when they're not. Okay, let me let me backtrack. When people are saying the giving reasons why they won't buy Android, mm -hmm. one common theme you hear quite frequently is fragmentation. Right. Uh, and, and because uh, the way it kind of works with what phones get upgraded to the latest version of Android, and so forth. Now. We were talking about, we want to kind of stick to the theme of the show, which is choosing the right platform from the get-go. Right. Uh, all these devices, you can have, you can absolutely have Macs in your office. You can have boxes running Linux. You can have boxes running Windows, especially in this day and age of uh, uh, cloud services for email and for contact management. Uh, for invoicing, all these other functions that a business may have, you don't. You can be absolutely device agnostic to a degree, right? But if you want harmony, uh, and by the way, uh, the Chromebooks, the new Chromebooks look interesting to me uh, because we are big time Google Apps users here at Frugal Brothers. We are big time Google Apps users. Right. Okay, because I love. The collaboration on Google Docs, for example, and and, and we use it in our sales processes. Uh, so we can be we could be device agnostic. I could run Google Apps very well on Windows. I can run it well on Mac. I, I, well, and I can run it well on uh, on, on uh, my Ubuntu box. Right. I, I have to be device agnostic with what I do. I mean, I just I have to have experience with each operating system and each platform, and I end up with, like you said, basically a jumbled up mess of a mismatch of I have Linux machines here, I have Mac, I have Windows, I have Windows XP, I have you know a couple of different versions of Linux, I have uh, you know the iPhone, and everything is kind of sort of integrated together, not as smoothly as I would like. It just makes things a lot more complicated. Um, but you know, this is a Mike. This is a nightmare scenario for Microsoft, right? See, what we're talking about. Well, right, and I can afford to do that because that's what I do for a living. I, I'm a tech for a living, so I can afford to, to take time to work out these bugs and these snags as I encounter them. You, If you're running a small business and you're running an office, that's that's downtime. You can't afford to You cannot, that. right, exactly. And I don't recommend the mismatch approach. I, uh, I, never, I would never. I, I would not go into an office and say, gee, Sally likes Mac get her a Mac. Tim likes to have Ubuntu. Let him have Ubuntu. Right, right. And Mary and Jim want Windows. I think that for scalability, uh, for maximizing the most out of your investment, you, you, I think there needs to be some method to the madness there. Right. I agree. I'd have to agree with you. Okay. And it's like, no, uh, we're going to run Windows. Or no, we're going to run uh, OS 10, uh, and we're going to run Apple products. Or no, we're going to uh, go the uh, make open source work for us, and uh, 
use uh, our hardware to the best of our advantage. Oh. We, can do, we can do it either different way. But the point is, I think it's very important from the very beginning to think through, okay, not, I think people get so hung up over the initial purchase price that they forget about the long-term cost of ownership of something. Right, right. Uh, okay. I, I think that's probably more uh, uh, more of a, uh, an issue on the Mac side that people get hung up on price uh, versus uh, versus long-term uh, cost of ownership. I, I think that's a big issue because people have a tendency, they, they see this computer A over here with these specs and it, it has, you know, a certain, you know, type of specs that they need, whether it be a terabyte hard drive, ever how much RAM, ever how much processor. It has the specs that they're looking for. And then they look at the equivalent Mac and they see the price is maybe, you know, 30 to 50 percent more. And I'm not saying necessarily that it would be. I'm just saying as an example, the price is 30 to 50 percent more on the Mac side of things. And they're looking at that initial cost, but then when you sit down and you start figuring up uh, cost of ownership over ever how many years you're talking about owning the device, uh, people people tend to forget they're going to have to call in a tech to do things with that Windows machine that you're just not going to have to do on the Mac side of things. And I think that also would hold true with Linux. That, that I, I, you know, I, let me. I hate to interrupt you on this, but I don't want to lose this thought. Okay. Macs are not 25 percent or more expensive than PCs if you look at similar uh, PCs. No, and I would agree with you. I would agree okay. with you. And that's the problem. You cannot, it's not, you can't compare no. a $600 desktop. But people do. With a two thousand dollar iMac, but but people do, and that's the problem. People. No, I know, I know they do. I, right. I know they do, and that's why we do this show, exactly. is to say, look, folks, take some of what you hear out there and treat it with a grain of salt. Yep. Okay. And see, that goes back to what I was saying. People try to compare spec for spec, and you can't do that. I get in those arguments with people. I used to get in those arguments all the time. Look. Oh, I do too. Uh, that's a, that is a go nowhere uh, scenario. When you get into the price and spec war, why is it, you know, is it like you take the Mac Pro? You know, people will start ripping into the value of the Mac Pro because they're pricing it against a desktop PC, and and, and they don't really compare it to a true workstation versus workstation. Which is what it is. Which is what it is, and of course. You know the Mac Pro is going to look more expensive. People, I see people comparing the iMac to uh, a desktop, a uh, custom-made desktop system, I and mean, you can't do that either because can't, right. you're not looking at an all-in-one system. You're not looking at what the iMac offers, and another thing, you can't buy a 27-inch screen with a computer attached to it for that. So, you know, you actually, you, I mean, you, the, 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 what is it, the Dell XPS one, right. the 27-inch, right. but you start pricing those. Price but we're not. We're not. I'm not saying that. I've got a, just a really bad tickle. Mm. That's what the podcasting juice is for. That's what the podcasting uh, right. juice is for. But I, in all fairness, there's no harm in thinking about using a, a, a Mac platform for your small business. Mm -hmm. Okay, as long as, uh, and even if you have a piece of software. That only runs on Windows. If if it's, uh, you can use virtualization tools like Parallels exactly. to run a copy of Windows and run that virtual machine. I'm glad you brought that up because that was exactly what my next point was going to be. If you decide to go to the Mac side of things, for whatever reason, be it the hardware quality, be it the integration with iOS, uh, whatever reason it may be that you 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 choose to go with the Mac side. Uh, if you if you absolutely have to have say you have one piece of software, uh, let let's say for instance QuickBooks, you have one piece of software that is either not available on the Mac side or the Windows version of this particular software. In the case of QuickBooks, the Windows version is far superior to the uh, the Mac version. Then you do have the option. You can have one license. 
you can have one machine with virtualization, be it you know VMware, be it uh, if you want to go uh, a free Oracle, um, but you can you can have a virtual machine, or for that matter, you can dual boot into Windows, and you can have one Windows license for that entire setup if you absolutely must run that one piece of Windows only or Windows superior software. Well, I want to take I want to take this a, a bit a bit further. Um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, I kind of like a system that is homogenous. That is, if I was going, if I was going down the PC route, I would find a you know a, a quality PC, mm -hmm. and that's what everybody would get the same model. Everybody's got the same machine. Right. Okay. Um, the company that built the desktops would probably be, if I was going to go with the server avenue, would probably be the one I would try to select build my server. Okay? I think that it's important. Hang on a second. I am I'm so sorry. It's my, I got this tickle, just will not stop. More podcasting juice. More podcasting juice. Um, <coughs> But the people that make my server make my desktop PCs um, and the networking stuff, if I'm going to go with Netgear, it's going to be generally all, everything's Netgear or everything's going to be Linksys. Here's the reason why. Here's my reasoning for this. Support. Okay? If I order everything from, say, Dell, then I should just have to interface with Dell. You have one company to call. Right. I don't want to track warranties from HP, Gateway, um, Dell, and all over the place. Right. Maybe I've got Lenovo in there for laptops and all that. If I'm going to have a P Windows PC shop, I'm going to try to select a company that can provide me with the not only a, a quality desktop, but quality laptops and also a quality server if that's the avenue I'm going to go. Right. I'm going to keep my networking gear as homogenous as possible. And I'm going to I want to make sure that I'm able to grow without having to take a perfectly good router and tossing it because it can't keep up. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I, that if I need a switch, I'm going to get a good quality uh, switch. Hopefully one that uh, a company that makes the same thing as my router. So maybe I'll look at Cisco uh, or Linksys uh, for my switch and for m my router, let's say. If that makes any sense to you. No, um, <coughs> before we uh, go too far into that, you, you brought up support and having one company to call for support. I think that's uh, a lot of people really overlook uh, that particular aspect. Uh, and, and, and how much impact that can actually have. I've, I've actually been to a couple of different businesses um, and, and this was not a hardware thing, this was a software problem, but one company was running uh, Carbonite backup software on three of their systems and they were running, I don't remember what the, uh, what the name of the software was, but they were running a completely different software on three other machines which made absolutely no sense to me, but apparently somewhere along the line someone had gotten a great deal or what they perceived to be a great deal on this uh, this other software and they had a, uh, a three license deal. You could put it on three three different machines. So they had six machines running two different types of backup software and I'm on the phone with tech support on both machines trying to get these systems restored. And it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. But when you go, you know, as far as customer service goes, I have noticed with Apple, their customer service, I've never had a problem with them. Everything has, no matter what I have called about, it has always been a very smooth, very positive experience. Now, I know there are some horror stories out there, but it's not been my personal experience. On the PC side of things, I, I see there's a big variation um, in the level of support that you actually get and the quality of support you get. Uh, if you call Dell, for instance, you're going to get a different type or a different quality of support than you would if you call 
uh, a, a whatever other company. I'm not picking on Dell. I'm just saying you're going to get if you call HP, you're going to get one level of uh, 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 support. If you call Dell, you're going to get another. And another thing that but, I but, but, but let's be fair about something here, okay? okay? And this is something that is important not to overlook. You're only going to get that great support from Apple uh, after 90 days uh, if you buy okay. Apple Care. Now I'll agree with you on that. I will agree. Which with you. is unexcusable to me. You buy three thousand right. or twenty-five hundred dollars for an iMac, let's say, and you got ninety days phone support for that machine, and you're done. Right. Unless you're done you get their extended uh, warranty. Unless you get the extended warranty. Uh, now I'll agree with you on that. And that that's is, wrong. To me, that's wrong, and that would cheese me off in a heartbeat. That's a good point. And I'm glad you brought it up because it leads me right into the PC side of things. If you, you and you're 100% correct, if you want that support, if you want that great quality Apple support, you're going to have to spend that extra two to three hundred dollars or whatever it may be, depending on your device, on the extended Apple Care protection plan. You're 100% correct. Now let's compare it to the PC side of things. Let's let's say you call um, Dell. And you are calling about a uh, one of their servers, or you're calling about one of their workstations versus calling about one of their 1501 uh, Dell Inspiron laptop systems. The quality of support that you receive is not the same. It is not the same. It is 100% based on how much money you spent up front. If you have a workstation, you do not talk to the same people that you talk to if you bought one of their cheap three to four hundred dollar laptops. If you bought one of those, you talk to somebody who is in Pakistan who does not speak English very well at all. And I'm not being, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, uh, whatever, or you know, but I'm just saying the level of support that you're going to get if you have one of their workstations versus the level of support you get if you have one of their low end systems is not the same. So you have made that initial investment. You can compare it to Apple Care if you like, but I think you have made more than that initial investment uh, with uh, with the high end system over here. You have spent just as much, if not more, than if you'd have bought the Apple Care protection plan on the Apple side. So I mean, I, I and you you've probably had experience with that. I know I have. When I call about the high end workstations, or when I call about a Dell server. I get to talk to a guy who speaks really good English who's located in California. I don't get to talk to, you know, this this guy over here who English is not definitely not his first language and he takes me down this uh this pre uh, uh, uh pre-ordered list of things that he has to ask me before I can actually receive any help. So it's a whole different level depending on how much money you spent with Dell to begin with. And I'm like I said, I'm not picking on Dell here. I'm, I'm going to assume that other companies are probably along the same lines. The more your initial investment, probably the better support that you're going to end up getting. But I, I will agree with you that if you're going to go out and you spend four thousand dollars on a Mac Pro, I, I think they need to offer more than ninety day support. I will agree with you hundred percent on that because you've already made that initial investment. I shouldn't have to invest another three hundred dollars or uh, two hundred fifty nine dollars or whatever it is in three year support. I believe it should come with it automatically. I do too, and, and I and that's one of the things I, I I have used Apple technical support. I've had had good success, except in one instance, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, basically I was doing some try, attempting to do something that's not supported, um, which was to wire uh, do a time machine. Uh, via a USB drive hooked up to an airport base station and kind of make it into a quasi time capsule and Apple adamantly did not support that and will not support right. that. Right. Uh, and by the way, it's been my experience, folks, uh, uh, that time machine and wireless backups uh, is not a stable way of doing things. Uh, they work for a while, a while and then it stops. I would never recommend it. Uh, no. If you're going to do it, oh, actually, I would never recommend Time Machine as your sole backup anyway. I know some people do, but I, I would never recommend Time Machine as your only means of uh, uh, protection. I know a lot of people, and Apple included, they've been, they're guilty of trying to uh, 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 make 
uh, time machine seem better than what it actually is, but in my personal experience, time machine is buggy at best. Uh, it works about 60% of the time. Um, and I'm just, I have not been impressed with it. Now, I'm impressed with its ease of setup. Uh, if you want to talk about ease of setting up, uh, you know, it, it can't be beat. But if you look at the Windows side of things, their technology is to the point where you can plug in a drive and it asks you if you want to back up. So, uh, you know, I, 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 don't trust, uh, I don't trust Time Machine, and I would never suggest that someone use Time Machine as their sole method of backing up. I would definitely recommend uh, some type of uh, uh, a more uh, structured backup plan instead of just trusting Time Machine. I think it's a great addition to a, a regimented uh, backup uh, system, but it shouldn't be your only method of backing up. Well, I don't, yeah, well, uh, backups, uh, and, and that might be a real good topic for another show, but uh, there's kind of a philosophy for a good backup plan, what they call a 3 2 one mm -hmm. uh, type backup plan. Um, I use a combination of things. Uh, on the Mac side of things, I use uh, Time Machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, critical files uh, get backed up to a NAS, okay? Right. And then the NAS, in turn, uh, at midnight, will send backups to, which is, by the way, an arrayed, uh, what arrayed, was it zero, the, yeah, arrayed, the mirrored RAID, is that one, RAID, RAID one? Five. RAID one or RAID five? Yeah, well, RAID one. RAID so one. it's configured RAID one, and then at midnight, uh, I have an Amazon account, the critical files and folders will, uh, from the NAS will then be backed up into the cloud. Okay? okay. So I have a, a copy on the machine, a local machine. There's a backup on the uh, on the uh, uh, time machine. There's a, another copy on the NAS, and then a copy in the cloud. Yeah, I don't consider the copy on the, the machine, the local machine itself. I don't Not really, yeah. Right, I don't consider that part of it because that's the machine that's going to fail. Right. And, uh, so what? I, and I have a similar backup strategy as well. The difference is I don't use Time Machine at all. Uh, I use Carbon Copy, cl a combination of Carbon Copy Cloner. Um, uh, what is it? Um, there's a there's another one here I use for a disk image, Super Duper, for a disk image, and I back up critical files uh, daily with Carbon Copy Cloner. I have it set to automatically back up daily to an external drive. And once a week, I'll do a complete system image uh, of my drive, and I take another system image, and I keep that off-site. Well, folks, you can do similar type of thing on the Windows side of things as well. Now, Easily, and they have made it. I will say Windows has come a long way yes. in making it used to. I mean, you've always been able to do backups on the Windows side of things, but with Windows 7 and now with Windows 8, now I'm not sure... Uh, if anything has changed on the uh, the Windows 8 side as far as backing up, but I know with the introduction of Windows 7, it became dirt simple to, uh, to to back up your drive, and it made it almost where you didn't really have an excuse for not backing up. Right. Let's uh, let's just change gears here for a moment, and then let's talk about Linux as a platform. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I think people are going to run especially most people come from the Windows world, would not even really consider Linux. A initially, you mean I can get the operating system for free? Uh, I can get off, you know, an Office program for free? That turns them on. That can turns I, them on. Well, can I just say up front, I think we're going to catch heat from both sides. Uh, you probably will. <laughs> when we start getting into Linux, I, I think we're going to catch well, heat. There were some real realities here to it, okay? I, and, I, and, I, and I'll share this experience with you, okay? okay? I feel that Ubuntu, uh, and that is the distro that... Uh, uh, I have two favorite distros, uh, Linux Mint, okay? That's I like my, Mint. That's my favorite as well. <clears throat> I, I like Mint, and I like Ubuntu, both of them. Those are the two flavors I like. I have worked with Red Hat, uh, their enterprise version of Linux, and, and a few others, but mostly it's been I'm, Ubuntu. I'm with you on that. Okay. Far too often, I still find myself having to manually add repositories, spend too much time in the terminal. Um, for example, okay, uh, although Thunderbird uh, is... Uh, 
maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. I, I probably am. Okay, the, there are some real positives to Linux. Okay, there's no doubt. And uh, it's not like the old days where it was real difficult to install and didn't work with a lot of different hardware. It pretty much works with most everything out there. Most time, the install goes through nice and clean, right. and everything works. They've come a long way, baby, on that. No, you don't have to pay and, and purchase the Linux operating system. It's free. Yes, it comes pre-configured with a wide variety of applications, okay, uh, that you would, you would have to either purchase or go out and find on your own for either the Mac or the Windows world. Yes, there are Office-like applications. Yes, there is a program similar to Outlook for Linux called Evolution. Those are all the positives of it, but let's, I would not necessarily recommend Linux <coughs> as a platform uh, to a small business, and, and here's the reasons why. You will find yourself far too often, in my opinion, having to learn things uh, uh, such as how to add repository. You, you, in other words, if you don't feel comfortable in the command line, of, uh, working in a command line of Linux, and I'm going to assume if you're a small business and you're a restaurant or a bar or you're a bowling alley or whatever you are, uh, you probably really are busy, you know, Running. Doing that rather than wanting to be a, a you're busy a, running your business. Yeah, you really don't want to be learning how to to add a repository in order to get some application. Now, I, I give an example, real world. Okay, Thunderbird is fine. It's a it's a it's an okay email client, but it's not great, and you really have to go uh, to to make it. Uh, where I want to have my contacts and calendars and all that in one application, uh, I, you really got to go digging around through forums and everything and find out about what's called lightning. And then you got to dig around and figure out how the way to make lightning work with the calendar. And then well, you got to figure out. You're, you're trying to make Thunderbird into Outlook and it's never going to be Outlook. Not going to happen, is it? No, it's not, never. It's not going to happen. So try, then you add, uh, then you can get what's called evolution. Mm -hmm. Which does not ship anymore with Ubuntu. No, you have to download that. Uh... Yeah, and you have to know that there's such a thing as evolution out there. Right. You, you probably don't even know what evolution is. It, it, you've got uh, Thunderbird up there. Right. Okay. Well, I went and I got evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I deleted Thunderbird. But I wanted to get simple mail notifications going. Do you know what kind of challenge that was? To get mail notification, new mail message notifications come from Evolution. In I, I was going to ask you how long it actually took you to set it up because I played around with it for the better part of two weeks and couldn't get it to work right. I got it to work somewhat, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Uh, okay, I get an, an envelope that pops up in a little window, <laughs> and I get a little ding sound when, and sounds, that's as good as it gets, baby. Right, right. That's as good as it gets. That, that, that is familiar. That is not acceptable. No. Okay. If uh, these people that are uh, uh, that want to believe that they can put Linux into the business world in a big, big way, this stuff is not acceptable. Okay, um, and that's a problem. Uh, video drivers, drivers for video cards need to improve drastically in the Linux community uh, and there and, and by the way there is uh, uh, no as far as I can tell absolutely no decent accounting software out there for Linux it's just not existent now they, okay. have some, they have some accounting. They, they've got GNU right. new cache they, they have, have you tried some. to use it? Have you actually sat down and tried to use new cash? No, they, they do have some, but I have not heard anything positive about any of it. No. Uh, let, let me say this, um, as far as Linux goes. I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. Okay, all right. On the Linux side of things. And, you, and here's, now, take in mind what I'm about to say is what the Linux fans, the true Linux fans, have hit me with for the past five years or so. 
And when I say I, I've given a lot of the same reasons that you have, and here here's what they tell me. Okay, when you talk about like video drivers and uh, on the laptop side of things, wireless drivers is something I've always had a problem getting to work in Linux. Even though you know the, the hardware support, I will have to say has increased dramatically, especially within the past three to five years, with uh, with uh, in regards to certain distros such as. Uh, Ubuntu and uh, Linux Mint. The hardware support has increased dramatically in the past three years or so. But, but, and here's the thing. Here's what they're going to say. Well, there's always that Windows install where you have to go find drivers, and you have to know how to install these drivers. That's what they're going to say. And I've I've been hit with that same thing. Uh, a guy asked me one time, "Have you, you know, how many times have you installed Windows?" Well, probably thousands of times I've installed Windows. He said, well, uh, did all your drivers always work all the time? Or did you have to go find some NVIDIA drivers or whatever, or, you know, whatever it was, did you have to occasionally go find and dig for your drivers? And I had to admit, yeah, there's been times I've had to go to the Dell website and I've had to manually download the drivers and install them. Here's, but here's the difference, and that was my plain devil's advocate, and I'll agree with him on that. You know, there have been times on the Windows side of things that I've had to do that. But the number of times that I have had to do it with Linux far outnumbers the times I've had to do it with Windows. And you have to remember, I have installed Windows on thousands and thousands of machines. I've installed Linux on maybe a couple of hundred machines. And the number of times I have had to go manually look for drivers on the Linux side of things far outnumbers the time I've had to do it on the, the Windows side. Now, that being said, Let's look at what you have to do in order to get things to work on the Linux side of things versus the, the Windows side of things. If I have a Dell machine and I install Windows on it and I am missing a driver, I can go to dell.com, I can go to their driver section, it will recognize what machine I am running. From a drop down list, I can pick what operating system I'm running if it doesn't automatically recognize it. I click one button, I download a .exe file, and I'm good. I double click it, it runs, I'm good. With the Linux side of things, I may be sitting there for half a day trying to build my own driver from scratch. I've had to do it before with certain wireless drivers. I had to remove the wireless driver through terminal and then reinstall the wire, build a wireless driver, and then reinstall that. And it was a headache, and it ended up taking me about four hours to do this, and I kind of sort of know what I'm doing. So now if you're looking on the if you're looking at a small business who's trying to actually implement Linux, it, one, it's going to depend on what you're actually doing with your business. Maybe, maybe you can actually use Linux with what you're doing and it worked for you. And if so, that's great. That's great. I, more power to you because the number one thing with Linux is it's free. So if you can save that amount of money and you can make Linux work for what you want, that's great. But I will say, if you're going to be, for most businesses, if you're going to actually try to implement Linux, I would recommend that you have a Linux admin on hand at all times. I would definitely recommend you have someone who knows what they're doing with Linux on hand at all times. And if you can't afford to have that, I would not recommend Linux for, sm for most small businesses. I just can't do it. Yeah, I, I, in, in, in all good faith, I, I don't think I could recommend uh, uh, I, I could not recommend Linux as the go-to recommended platform for a small business myself. I, do it. I recommend it for individuals, I, and I do recommend Linux, uh, certain versions of Linux for certain individuals. And I'll give you an example. Uh, and, and the reason why I want to give you this example is because I don't want people to think I'm anti-Linux, because I'm absolutely not. Um, now, there was a time when I was, uh, I was borderline anti-Linux. When I first started getting involved in Linux, I was having so much trouble with it and so much frustration trying to learn how to make it work properly that, that I, I probably came across as very much anti-Linux, but I'm not. Uh, there are certain situations. I've had customers bring me their, uh, their netbook or their, their laptop or whatever, and they continually get infected. Okay. No matter what antivirus I install, no matter what anti-spyware software I install, uh, uh, open DNS, they, they still continuously get infected. Now, it's not my 
Um, it's not my job to be their nanny and, and, and make sure they go, don't go to bad websites. You, you have the human factor there. You're always going to have people that are going to go to those bad websites no matter what you tell them, no matter what you do. So I can't be sitting there holding their hand 24-7 to make sure they don't click on the free Xbox link or whatever. Um, so with, for those people, I have installed Linux. On, on, you know, on certain systems, I've installed Linux for them, and problem solved. They never get infected again after that. And it's great. But these people, I always ask them, what are you going to use this laptop for? And if their answer is, I'm going to write text documents, I'm going to do Facebook, and I'm going to surf the Internet, and that's it. That's all I'm going to do with this machine. Okay, Linux it is, and I'll put Linux on it. Or if it's a desktop system, an older refurbished desktop system, I'll install Linux on it. Yeah, I'm not, right, and I'm not saying that Linux doesn't have its place. Oh, it definitely has but its if place. But if you, I think if you want to really plan out for future growth, adding capacity, having a, 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 a smooth uh, way to grow, mm -hmm. pick a platform in the beginning, be as homogenous as you can, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and keep in consideration uh, things like support and warranties um, and uh, the availability of software for it, uh, and, and spend a few dollars to hire a computer technician in the very beginning because you know, computer technicians, are they... Uh, they understand. Uh, they understand. This is their business. Uh, uh, this is how they do things, and it's worth that investment in the very beginning. Just like when you sit down and talk to an accountant, whether you talk to an attorney, go ahead and talk and pay for a computer technician to uh, uh, help you design at least lay out a roadmap. Let, let me Maybe you can't do all this stuff today, but let's at right. least plan out what the core is going to be and then how you expand it down the road and, and, and pick that platform and stick with that platform if it works for you. That's let, kind of my end Let analogy. me jump in right quick and say that uh, I hire a reputable computer technician when you do this. When you, when you hire your computer technician for advice, make sure you're hiring a reputable computer technician uh, someone that has good references and that are not going to try to upsell you uh, things that you don't need. Yeah, uh, and you and absolutely you do. You you, you do run in, into that situation, but you know, ask around and ask other businesses. You know, who did you go to? Who did you ask for advice? Who did you get to come? You know, set your your small business. Who did you get to come set up your network? And if they were happy with that service, you know, that might be something you need to check into. But uh, don't don't just go on Craigslist and find your computer tech and ask them to come out and uh. Not you know what you, you, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a mechanic. Okay, right. I, I I like cars and I used to work on my kids and all that, but. Uh, finding a good mechanic or a good plumber or whatever, they're worth their weight in gold. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Your computer technician is, is, is the same way. And you're usually going to hear about those through word right. of mouth. Through word of mouth. Yeah. Exactly. You probably will. And uh, you'll find that a good computer technician uh, is in high demand. Mm -hmm. They're busy, busy people. But you know what? They're not too busy to, to spend a little bit of time with you and help you get your small business up off the ground and do it the right way. And it's going to end up saving you money in the long run. Uh, you know the old saying, a penny wise and pound foolish. And nothing's more true than when it comes to the world of technology. I think we're going to wrap up this week's episode of Business Computing Weekly on that note. Uh, join us again next Sunday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. We're on Standard Time now. So everybody, take care. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week. Take care, everybody.